When it comes to Mermista, I don't know what's stronger. Her love-hate relationship with sea shanties, her sarcasm, or her hydrokinetic abilities. But I do know that she is one of the coolest princesses in all of Etheria. Mermista is inarguably one of the strongest princesses of the bunch, stepping up to the plate as Sira when the best friend squad was off-world battling the Horde. And let's be real, her sense of humor kills. I'm Whitney Van Lanningham, and today we're diving into the deep of Mermista's history and symbolism. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our super nerd sponsor of the day, Kevin Brown, for supporting us on Patreon. The original Mermista was pretty different from the sarcastic, murder mystery loving princess we know from She Ra and the Princesses of Power. For starters, the Kingdom of Selenius was still being run by her father, King Mercier. The two are French in the OG series, with Mermista's voice actress, Melanie Britt, using an accent for the role. Fun fact Melanie Britt also voiced She Ra, Adora, Catra, Castispella, and Scorpia. Girlfriend was busy from 85 to 97. Her personality in the 80s series is a lot more demure than the outspoken, wisecracking princess we know today. Selenius is completely underwater in this rendition, and when she revisits for the first time in the episode The Pearl, she has to wear a scuba suit to dive down into the kingdom. King Mercier is indifferent to the Horde, believing that if they leave Hordak alone, they'll be left alone in return. Mermista and her people draw their power and ability to live underwater from the Power Pearl, a gigantic pearl that formed when the oceans first filled on the earth. Without it, she and the other merfolk cannot transform from humans to mermaids and back again, and their powers disappear. Mermista's powers include the ability to telepathically communicate with all ocean life, including send and receive distress signals from any sea creature. She's incredibly passionate about protecting the ocean and its inhabitants from harm, and she does support the rebellion, even if her father doesn't. In the Pop Mini comics, Mermista lived in the Crystal Falls, where her aquatic prowess was a great asset to the Rebellion. She had all the same abilities as the OG Mermista, talking to sea critters and going back and forth between human legs and a mermaid tail, with the addition of an enchanted necklace that shoots water at her enemies. The UK World Pop Annual comics portrayed Mermista as the queen of Etheria's oceans rather than the princess, and in the German audiobook version, she would grow angry when others polluted or otherwise harmed the sea. The 1986 pop comic magazines took her relationship with ocean life to the next level, portraying her as someone who enjoyed the company of her aquatic pals far more than other humans. Despite this, however, she would jump to help her friends in the rebellion any time she recalled upon her. In the 2008 Modu classics, things get hardcore in the second ultimate battleground. When Skeletor attacks, Mermista is forced to go head to head with Merman, and in the fight, she actually decapitates him with a trident. I gotta say, I'm pretty glad they made true crime and sea shanties her thing in the new series instead of beheadings. In the OG series, and across all comic iterations and action figures, Mermista is white with long blue hair. She wears a forest green bustier over a blue bodysuit, and her mermaid tail matches her outfit when she transitions from her human legs into half fishy. This character design is consistent across all media, and her look didn't really change much until the reboot. The Mermista we know and love today has more of a Princess Jasmine vibe going for her. She wears a blue, aqua, and gold crop top with matching leggings and a totally sick shoulder pad situation. She has a darker complexion in this series, which is a refreshing switch up from the predominantly white original characters. Also, the animators opted for dark blue hair this time around instead of the OG pastel color that Mermista used to rock. Current Mermista's day-to-day -day look is way more laid back. When our girl gets dressed up, she also looks amazing. Now let's get into her modern backstory. Unlike the former Mermista, our Mermista is fully in charge of ruling Selenius in the aftermath of her father's retirement. That's really all we hear about her family. King Mercier isn't mentioned by name, and the subject of her dad only comes up once in her debut episode. Also, like, I get he's retired, but you'd think her dad would step in to help his kid when the Horde completely trashes the kingdom later on in the series. Her powers include transforming from mermaid to human and back, hydrokinesis, and the ability to breathe underwater. Although she doesn't regularly speak dolphin or anything like that, we do know that she's able to communicate via seagull. Adora, Glimmer, and Bo are introduced to Princess Mermista through her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Seahawk. Seahawk will probably get his own video in the future, but for now, here's the scoop. He has a huge, huge crush on Mermista, and no matter how many times she rebuffs his adorable advances, he persists. This would definitely be creepy and intense if Mermista wasn't into it. You can tell by the way she's constantly blushing around him that she kinda secretly likes him too. He did set fire to their boat in the Tunnel of Love one time though, so I can see why she has her apprehensions. 
Seahawk is an adventurer to his core, but he's made a lot of enemies in Etheria because of the whole constantly setting boats on fire thing. Seahawk tells the best friend squad that he'll take them on his ship to Selenius to try to talk Mermista into joining the rebellion. When they arrive, they find the kingdom in woeful disrepair, completely understaffed and in danger of falling to the Horde. Daddio basically left his daughter with a crumbling kingdom to rule, and although she's trying her best, she could really use the Princess Alliance's help. Although she's hesitant to join at first, that all changes when she stops Catra and Scorpia from breaking down the sea gate to finish off Selenius once and for all. I mean, she's right. Who wouldn't want a badass eight-foot-tall lady on their side? When Bo and Glimmer are taken by the Horde, Ermista, along with Entrapta, Perfuma, and Frosta, help Adora break them out. Ermista's job is definitely the grossest. She has to enter the Fright Zone via the sewer systems and unlock one of the entrances from the inside so that the rest of the princesses can carry out their rescue mission. That means that Homegirl had to breathe underwater in literal sewage. Gross. But because she does this incredibly icky job, she now has a full working knowledge of the Fright Zone sewer system, a talent that will come back in a huge way later on in the series. But after the operation, Entrapta is presumed dead, so Mermista is the first princess to bow out of the Alliance in fear for her safety and the safety of her people. She can't risk anyone in her kingdom getting hurt because she's a part of the rebellion, and after she drops out, the rest of the princesses follow suit. Thankfully, she and the other princesses show up to help She-Ra and the best friend squad in the Battle of Bright Moon. When the Horde activates the Black Garnet, it begins throwing all of the other runestones out of whack, and Glimmer's powers keep glitching out because of it. When Queen Angela, Bo, Glimmer, She-Ra, Spinarella, and Natasa fail to keep the Moonstone safe from Entrapta's new super-powered robots in the Horde, Mermista and Seahawk appear, followed by Perfuma and Frosta. Working together with the Sword of Protection, the princesses create a rainbow wave of magic that restores the Moonstone along with the other runestones. With their runestones restored, they easily defeat the Horde together, and both Queen Angela and Glimmer are healed. It took a lot of guts for Mermista to change her mind about the rebellion, because without her, the rest of the other princesses might have never changed their minds either. This is one of the first instances where we see her kind of assuming the role of the Princess Alliance's second in command after she wrote. The other princesses value and trust her opinion, and although there's no official ruling, she naturally falls into place as the group's lead. This becomes more apparent when the princesses play a round of D&D to come up with a plan to invade the Horde. Mermista names her character Sira and claims to be a super tall, trident-wielding copycat of She-Ra that can talk to dolphins. When they attack the Fright Zone for real, Mermista easily takes out the tower Scorpia, Lonnie, and Regelio were trying to protect. When She-Ra and the Sword of Protection are taken by the Horde, Glimmer and her mom get into a huge fight about the right way to rescue her. Glimmer wants to tap into the Runestone to access more of her powers, and Shadow Weaver has promised to help her. Mermista, Bo, Perfuma, and Frosta agree to go to the Fright Zone with the two sorcerers against Queen Angela's wishes. And because Mermista knows the sewer system like the back of her hand now, she's able to use Hydrokinesis to hold off the Horde while the others press on with the mission. But without access to water, Mermista is unfortunately kind of useless in a fight. When the gang heads to the Crimson Waste, she has to stay behind because she wouldn't be able to do anything in the middle of the desert. Basically, she has the same views as Anakin Skywalker on sand. What Mermista lacks in dryland powers, she makes up for in tenfold with her murder mystery solving prowess. Okay, she doesn't actually solve anything, but it's the passion that matters, dang it! If Mermista was a normal person on Earth, she would 100% have started a true crime podcast with Seahawk by now. She's read all 18 books in the Mer Mysteries series, and she's a damn fine private eye. When it's made clear that there's a spy in their midst, Mermista leaps to action as the lead detective interrogating the citizens of Bright Moon to get to the bottom of the case. Although she doesn't find any evidence of murder, because there was none, Mermista does finally help narrow it down to the princesses, Seahawk, Bo, and Flutterina. And we find out that Double Trouble has actually been spreading misinformation among the princesses in disguise as Flutterina this whole time. Unfortunately, Double Trouble also reveals some devastating news. While Mermista was running around trying to identify the spy, the Horde attacked Selenius and conquered her kingdom. Glimmer teleports her back home immediately, but it's too late. The Seagate is broken, and the city has been decimated. Ermista collapses in tears at the sight of her fallen kingdom, and Glimmer promises her friend that they will avenge Selenius no matter what it takes. 
like literally anyone would, Hermista responds to the loss of her kingdom by spending all day in her mermaid form, lounging in the bathtub, and eating every pint of ice cream in Bright Moon. Girl, same. That's been me every day of this pandemic. To cheer her up, Seahawk decides to get himself, Bo, and Swiftwind fake kidnapped so that his beloved and her friends would be forced to come rescue him. Nothing cheers Mermista up more than a solid adventure, so the sentiment was very, very sweet. Until it didn't go according to plan. Instead of getting fake kidnapped by a friend, Seahawk and the guys get for real kidnapped by one of Seahawk's fireboat enemies. Here we learn that Seahawk can also communicate with seagulls because he sends Mermista a message to come rescue them from the bounty hunter's boat in the middle of the sea. Of course, the plan is to sell the boys to the horde in exchange for a hefty price on Seahawk's head. But luckily, Mermista and the crew show up just in time to save them. Seahawk was totally right. Battling evil with her friends immediately gives Mermista a huge rush of serotonin and pure joy. Obviously, it doesn't change the fact that her entire kingdom fell to the bad guys, but it helps kick her butt back into action after a long, depressive spell. What more could you ask of from a friend slash occasional boo thang? Together, Mermista and Seahawk sing a rock and roll version of Seahawk's Sea Shanty, It's Fun to Fight with Friends, and you can tell that her happiness skyrockets. When Hordak Prime threatens to use the Heart of Etheria as a weapon to wipe out the entire galaxy, Glimmer suggests that they use the Heart to restore all of the Fallen Kingdoms before they fight for the universe's life. Mermista is the first one to vote yes on this plan, vowing to do anything she possibly can to get Selenius back. With the Heart of Etheria restored to full functionality in the planet Balanced, all of the princesses experience a power surge during their fight, and Mermista takes down entire fleets of spacecrafts with her souped-up tidal waves. Move over, Johnny Tsunami, there's a new queen in town. But with this power surge comes a drastic drop. First one's writing appears on Mermista's face, and she falls from her vortex, followed in suit by the rest of the princesses collapsing. Thankfully, once Adora manages to seal the heart of Etheria away, its hold over the princesses breaks. Unfortunately, it also robs Adora of her she powers, and she becomes a normal mortal. Although Shadow Weaver still wants to use the Heart of Etheria to fight Hordak Prime, Mermista is vocally against it in their tactical defense meeting. After what she experienced, she does not trust the Heart as a casual weapon whatsoever. She begins to help train Adora to get used to fighting without her powers anymore, and is incredibly supportive when her friend feels frustrated by her mortal limitations. Princesses decide to work together to help Adora, who can no longer do every single thing for herself at superhuman strength. Without Adora's powers, the gang agrees that they can't bring her with them on their next mission to find Horde Prime's ship in space after Glimmer is taken. Hermista is still used to Adora being in charge, but even though Sira is a joke, she does feel like she has to step up in her place and lead the others. She unofficially becomes the leader of the rebellion in Adora, Bo, and Glimmer's absences. Mermista comes up with the plan. Sneak past the surveillance bots at the Fright Zone and get Entrapta as close to the Spire as possible so that she can track Horde Prime's ship using its signal. She still doesn't trust Entrapta. She's betrayed them before, and Mermista is worried that she'll turn back to Hordak and Hordak Prime if they let her go to space with Bo and Adora. Mermista is constantly aggravated with her, but she agrees to try to trust Geek Princess because Scorpia begs her to give her a chance. She views the way that Entrapta is going about their mission as selfish and single-mindedly focused. Because she doesn't know Entrapta that well yet, she assumes that she only cares about the mission because she's excited about going to space and using cool tech. Mermista really cares about Adora and is upset because she feels like Entrapta doesn't. Once she realizes that Entrapta is also trying to help save Glimmer, she trusts her again. After she and Entrapta get on the same page, Mermista regains her confidence in her ability as their leader and is able to successfully refocus the princesses on their mission. Although they're in the desert and she normally wouldn't be able to use her powers, Mermista realizes that she can use the sewer system once again to her advantage. Princesses succeed in their mission, and when they return to camp, she promises Adora that she'll hold down the fort while she, Bo, and Entrapta blast off to save Glimmer and Catra. Her next mission? Create a diversion so that these soon-to-be astronauts can steal Mara's ship and take off after Prime. She decides to dress up King Micah as She-Ra, probably because he's the tallest, in order to distract the bots so that Bo, Glimmer, and Entrapta can make their getaway. Gotta admit, Micah's drag persona is fierce. But Mermista knows that they can't keep fighting alien robots alone. 
She and Seahawk devise a plan to ask the elusive Prince Peekaboo to help them fight the Horde with his power of foresight. Perhaps if they can predict the Horde's next move, they'll be more equipped to stop them. Because Marmista loves a good murder mystery party, she gives everyone aliases and they dress up for the occasion. They plan to accost Peekaboo at the Enchanted Grotto's underwater soiree, but they have to keep their identities a secret because Marmista lit somebody at the party's boat on fire. And Seahawk definitely probably lit several people's boats on fire. Every single person at the party is either a bounty hunter or a pirate, so they'd sell them out to the Horde in a heartbeat if they found out who they truly were. Before they can party, Mermista and Seahawk have to take down all of Seahawk's nemeses so that no one gets to them before they can get to Peekaboo. This is when Mermista confesses that she actually also lit someone's boat on fire, and you can literally see Seahawk falling even more in love with her by the second. But somehow, whenever Mermista is living her best life trying to be a cool mystery lady, double trouble seems to appear. It turns out that they've been masquerading as Peekaboo, and that they obviously don't have the powers they need to defeat the Horde. To make matters way, way worse, Mermista gets chipped by the Horde while Scorpia, Seahawk, and Perfuma are questioning double trouble. One with the hive mind, she encourages her friends and the other partygoers to join her in Horde Prime's life. She uses her hydrokinesis for evil this time and blasts holes in the glass dome of the grotto. When she tries to chip the others, Scorpia is forced to fight her off as long as she can while the others escape. Unfortunately, she gets chipped by Mermista because she can't get away. With Bo, Glimmer, Adora, and Catra back from space, they team up with Natasa, Perfuma, and the other unchipped members of the Rebellion to save their friends. Natasa lists Mermista's weakness as fire, obviously. But when Catra tries to face her down at the Fright Zone, Mermista uses her handy-dandy sewer water trick to attack her. She sends wave after wave at Catra, but because she's cloaked by Milog, Mermista can't see her at first. When she reveals herself, Mermista tries to drown her in the control room with a giant tidal wave. Luckily, Milog and Catra manage to get out of there. The Horde's bots trap the Rebellion in a crater basin so that Mermista can flood it with water. Once it's filled, Scorpia electrocutes all of them with her lightning. While they're down, Mermista attempts to drown them again with another tidal wave. But thankfully, Glimmer shows up just in time to protect them all with a shield. She and Cast a spell a bundle up the tidal wave in the seal and throw it back in Mermista's face to defeat her. Seahawk loves Mermista so much that he's willing to risk his life to deactivate her chip. With his two main powers, sea shanties and cheesy flirting, he manages to distract her. He reminds her of the very first time that they met, and how she tried to kill him then, too. Even through the Horde's programming, Mermista gets totally embarrassed, groans, and asks him why he's like this. Seahawk responds by telling her that it's because he loves her. This diverts her attention long enough that Perfuma can whack her in the back of the neck with one of her vines, breaking the chip. She passes out in Seahawk's arms because until the chip can be fully deprogrammed, she's going to be kind of out of it for the rest of the battle. Thankfully, once Bo breaks everyone in Etheria free from the chips once and for all, Mermista awakens. She's definitely a little weirded out by Entrapta being best friends with Hordak again, but something tells me she'll eventually get over it. Although we weren't given any real confirmation, I like to think that she finally admitted to Seahawk that she loves him too. They have a full-on Han Solo Princess Leia vibe to their relationship, and I'm here for it. From Mermista, we learn that it's okay to ask your friends for help when you need it, and that you are strong enough to step up into a leadership role when your friends need you in return. This girl is so independent, she won't even call Seahawk her plus one at Princess Prom. I think she's also the hardest person in the group to prove yourself to, as evidenced by her relationship with Entrapta. Mermista is able to realize that she was wrong about Geek Princess, and once she gets to know her true heart, they become friends. Watching Mermista open up to various friends throughout the series feels really rewarding because in the end, friendship, love, and working together is what defeated Hordak Prime. It's long been thought that mermaids symbolize mystery and allurement, so it totally makes sense that Mermista is a mystery fanatic. Likewise, mermaids are storied to be fiercely independent and untamable, yet lusted after by men of the sea. If that doesn't describe her relationship with Seahawk to a T, I don't know what does. Other mermaid tales often depict them as powerful beings who love and care for Mother Earth and her oceans. If you're an ally to the environment, mermaids will always be on your side. They're also considered to be highly feminine beings, and it's believed that the idea of the first mermaids were based on goddesses from mythology like Venus and Calypso. The pearl, Mermista's runestone, is also a strong symbol of femininity. Although they aren't traditional gemstones, pearls often invoke imagery of the moon and the water. Because the moon is responsible for the tides of the ocean, and pearls are obviously found in the ocean, 
many cultures have lunar associations with pearls. In ancient texts, pearls were said to be born from Earth's waters and heaven's powers. Western culture often associates the pearl with the planet Venus, because like the Greek goddess, they come from the sea. Because pearls are found within the oyster, they also symbolize hidden wisdom. Hermista is also the only princess who rules over both the land and the sea, making her inarguably one of the most powerful of the bunch. Her ability to transform makes it easy for her to traverse any landscape. And you gotta admit, being able to swim like Michael Phelps and rule a kingdom sounds pretty cool. I honestly think that Vermista is my favorite princess out of all of them. I love her dry wit and sarcasm, her style, and her super cool princess powers. But I want to know what you guys think in the comments. Let me know where Marista ranks on your list, like and subscribe to Nerdwire, and stay tuned for more She-Ra videos.